Woodard, the Connecticut State Historian and Associate Professor of Early American History at the University of Connecticut. He teaches American environmental history, public history, Connecticut history, and an honors American studies course focused on the Connecticut River. He is the author of the award-winning book, Prospero's America, John Winthrop Jr., Alchemy and the Creation of New England Culture, and recently co-authored Teaching History with Museums, Strategies for K-12 Social Studies, along with Professors Alan Marcus and Jeremy Stoddard. Professor Woodward is also a columnist for Connecticut Explored Magazine, co-editor of Commonplace, the Journal of American, Early American Life, and producer of Grading the Nutmeg, a podcast about Connecticut history and culture, which is available through iTunes. He is also a member of the Connecticut State Historical Records Advisory Board and a great advocate for the use of original records. Please join me in welcoming Professor Walter Woodward. Thank you so much. About a year ago, uh, due to the good offices of the State Library and the Connecticut Historical Society, I was contacted by uh, a person I have come to like very much, a man named P.J. O'Mara from the Care Social and Historical Society in the county of Tipperary, Ireland. Care was getting ready to celebrate a big anniversary the 100th anniversary of the birth of their Connecticut governor, John Noel Dempsey. It was also the 50th anniversary of his return in 1965, which can be described as little less than triumphant. So they were pulling out the stops, and they said, would you come over and would you tell us about Governor Dempsey's career as governor in Connecticut? And I thought about it for a minute, and I said, would I? <laughs> and I said, yes. And that began one of the busiest and most interesting summers of my life. I headed for the archives, and both here and Van Block. And thanks to Alan and Lizette and the staff, I uh, got access to the incredible records of Governor Dempsey which were augmented when I got an email from someone named Ed Dempsey, hmm, who said, I hear you're doing a talk about my father. We should talk. So, so I then, uh, shortly thereafter, met with Ed. We had breakfast. And Father Ed is a, uh, he's a fascinating guy. You, you, you've got to be very, very much like your father. I think of you two as being quite alike. And through Ed's good graces, in addition to the gubernatorial records, I had access to many of the governor's personal papers and photos. In September of last year, Father Ed and Kevin, and several members of the Dempsey family, my wife and I, and the mayor of Putnam, Tony Palzerano, headed off for Tipperary. It's a long way, but not that long. <laughs> and at that, it, it turned out to be I just a magic, a magic weekend. And the highlight, there were several highlights. Father Dempsey's sermon in the church in which he was ordained. Uh, for me, visiting schools, visiting the school kids, and going up to an Irish school 3,000 miles away and seeing an American and a Connecticut flag waving out front. That was cool. It was also cool when I walked in the classroom, everybody stood up. I thought, wow, this is, there's something for Catholic education. So anyway, this is the talk verbatim that I gave in care, in Care Castle last September. So I hereby declare you for the next 30 minutes or so, maybe 40 minutes, citizens of Care Ireland. And I am now going to talk to you about your most important native son. John Noel Dempsey may have been the best governor Connecticut ever had. 
He certainly was one of the most popular governors in our state history and one of the most unique. He served for nine years, 11 months, and 16 days. That was longer than any governor had stayed in office for nearly a century and a half. And when he retired, it was his choice to step down, not the decision of the people at the ballot box. John N. Dempsey was the rarest of politicians, a man who even his opponents liked and admired. He possessed great charm and fast wit, was a gifted orator, a tireless worker for the causes he believed in, and he was an extraordinary manager. He was a family man, not in the smile for the camera sense we get from so many politicians today, but in the next to God my family matters most sense that reflected the deepest convictions of this remarkable man. He was a person above all with a great compassion for humanity and a sense that God put him on this earth to do good. Now, I'm a historian. I'm trained to search out the motivations and complexities and self-serving characteristics of those in power. And when it comes to politicians, as you can imagine, statements like the ones I just made don't come easy. But I did spend months researching the life of Governor Dempsey. I poured through the archives, talked with those who knew him, and thanks to Father Ed and the family, I've had unusual access into even the personal papers and life of this man. And despite my deeply ingrained historian skepticism, even perhaps cynicism, I'm here today to tell you that John Noel Dempsey was the real deal. A good man who cared deeply about people who became a great governor of the state I love. And he was also a son of care through and through Dempsey was the first immigrant elected governor of Connecticut since the colonial days of the 1600s, when most Connecticuts were immigrants. And he wore his Irish roots with extreme pride. Throughout his life, he traced the foundations of both his character and his political success to his boyhood in care, not just to the faith, friends, community, and land that made this such a good place for a boy to be raised, but also to specific experiences, profoundly personal and profoundly memorable, that helped a boy understand what mattered in a man's life. And so in the remainder of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the political life of John Noel Dempsey and reflect on the specific experiences he had here that shaped his life and thinking over there. One of those experiences happened, let me back up a bit. One of those experiences happened on the very day the 10-year-old and his parents, Ned and Nell Dempsey, left, or rather tried to leave for America. After the final packing of suitcases, tearful farewell to friends and family, and more than a parting glance, the family had made its way to court and boarded one of those white star line ships for passage to America. This was in the summer of 1925. In 1970, as he neared the end of his governorship, Dempsey himself described what happened. We were actually aboard ship, ready to sail, when a complication arose in the form of a demand for a much higher fee than we had been led to expect, for the health certificates we were required to have. Convinced, and no doubt rightly so, that an attempt was being made to victimize him, my father, a veteran of many years of army service, refused to pay. Instead, we disembarked, returned to our county temporary home in care, and the ship sailed without us. Back in care, my father got in touch with the civic leader of his acquaintance. The difficulty about the health certificate's fee dissolved like magic, and 10 days later, we were on our way again, this time for good. Could it be that this experience gave me, a 10-year-old boy, his first inkling of the way in which a person in responsibility can be of help to others? Quite possibly. Certainly, throughout his life in public office, 
Dempsey recognized both the ability and the responsibility of political leaders to use their influence to help meet people's needs, especially those who could not help themselves or people who could not get responsive service elsewhere. Strikingly, one of his first acts in public life and the one that launched his political career was an act reminiscent of his father's that day in 1925 when he left the ship and brought his family back to care to seek help in taking care of a difficulty. In the way of many Irish immigrants, the Dempseys came in America to a place where they already had family. In this case, the textile mill town of Putnam, where Nell Dempsey's sisters and a brother lived. There, Ned Dempsey found work in the Putnam woolen mills, not unlike the supervisory work he had performed at the Going and Smith flour mill in Cairn. Nell made the family home in a rented house from which they could walk to St. Mary's Catholic Church, and John, the future governor, settled easily into the Putnam school system. He was a natural athlete, and in addition to excelling in debate and literature, he became captain of both the high school basketball and the track teams. After graduation, he hitched a daily ride with other students to Providence College, where he set an intercollegiate track record for the half mile that wasn't broken for a generation. His freshman year at Providence was to prove his only year there. His father's illness and the effects of the Great Depression made it a necessity for him to work at the woolen mills for $22.50 a week. And then he encountered the street light that changed his life. As Bill Stanley, a fellow Irish American and a former state rep from Norwich told it, "'Twas the street light, you know, that he couldn't get fixed that brought John Dempsey into politics. The street light near the Dempsey home had burned out, and calls and letters trying to get the bulb replaced didn't get any response. So as his father had done back in care, young John took his case to the persons in responsibility who could help with this difficulty. Not yet 21, he appeared before the Putnam Board of Aldermen and made a speech asking for help. The aldermen were so impressed, they not only ordered the light fixed, they suggested young Dempsey run for alderman at the next election. And so, at 21, John Dempsey entered public service through asking people in power to get things done for people who weren't. And as a person in power, he would get things done for others from various positions of public responsibility for the next 35 years. Over the years, Dempsey held every elective office the town of Putnam had, including serving as mayor for six terms. He was elected to the General Assembly of Connecticut three times, and in his third term, he was chosen by his peers the party leader of his chamber. The reporters covering that session voted him the most able lawmaker in the House. He became executive assistant to Governor, uh, Connecticut Governor Abraham Ribicoff in 1955. And then in the 1958 election, Ribicoff chose Dempsey to run as his lieutenant governor. Ribicoff knew then that even if re-elected, he would be deeply engaged in helping John F. Kennedy run for the presidency. And he told colleagues he wanted someone as lieutenant governor who was close to him someone he could leave in charge of the school. And that's exactly what he did. When JFK became America's first Irish Catholic president in 1960, the first cabinet appointment he made was, uh, was Abraham Ribicoff, who went to Washington as his Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. He handed the keys to the store, as it were, to Lieutenant Governor John M. Dempsey, who became governor on the 21st of January, 1961. A political wag at the time said Dempsey was the understudy with a big chance, and he made the very most of it. Described by one reporter as coming into office a little unsure of himself, he had, by the next election 20 months later, transformed himself into a sure-footed political orator, a powerful speaker, with a long list of accomplishments to his credit. 
He defeated a strong competitor to win the governorship in his own right in 1962. And four years later, he won a resounding victory over a popular Republican opponent in a year when Republicans swept the elections in all the surrounding states. Dempsey held the reins of power for 10 years, and by the time he announced that he would step down from office in January 1961, or pardon me, 1971, he had presided over a complete transformation of Connecticut from a state known for its general tight-fistedness into a state singularly known for its commitment to help those who could not help themselves. The changes in Connecticut in that de de decade are truly transformative, and he was right at the center of them all. If Dempsey's belief in the responsibility of those in power to help those who are not came from that boyhood shipboard experience with his father, his total commitment to those in need came perhaps from his mother and another care experience. It was a simple and spontaneous act. Ellen Luby Dempsey, John Mother's Nell, waited from the banks of the mall out into the then rushing waters of the river shore to save a dog, even though she herself couldn't swim a stroke. Like his mother, John Dempsey launched out boldly to help those in need, and he did so fearlessly throughout his career as governor. He expanded facilities for the mentally retarded, the handicapped, and the mentally ill. He set up new departments of children and youth and of the aging. The existence of such governmental social service agencies are all but taken for granted today, but in 1960, they didn't exist. They represented radical innovations and in ideas about government's responsibilities toward the unfortunate. And John Noel Dempsey was a great champion of that new approach in both word and deed. The physically and mentally ill, the disabled and the handicapped, the blind, the deaf, the mentally retarded, the helpless and the needy are, even as we are, children of Almighty God, he told the General Assembly in his 1966 State of the State Address, the kind of Connecticut we have created and which we want to maintain and improve will not permit them to suffer neglect. What greater reward can we know, he asked, than the light which our, helps bring, our help brings to the eyes of a crippled child? Will we measure their needs in terms of cold budget figures? Or will we acknowledge that the enrichment which they bring into our lives far outweighs the cost? Dempsey said it, and he meant it. And one of the ways he showed the strength of his commitment was through an event that made some of those around him at the time really uncomfortable, at least at first. Alan Olmsted, a columnist for the Manchester, Connecticut Herald, wrote about this event and I'll quote this column extensively because I think it communicates just how radical John Dempsey's commitment to those others would have preferred to put out of sight and forget about was just 50 years ago. Olmsted had been invited to one of the traditional Christmas parties for the press held at the governor's mansion. But this year, he noted, something new had been added. There was on the walls a display, a new display of art. And the art display, in picture after picture, was art produced by inmates of state mental institutions. Olmsted's words. Some was perhaps elemental and hopeless, artistically speaking, and some seemed very impressive, but we wouldn't know from art standards, Olmsted wrote. What we did notice was the extraordinary interest and pride with which Governor Dempsey and his First Lady Mary Dempsey display these paintings on their walls, not merely for their visual interest, but for the fact that they've been produced by lives which, in another day and age, might have been considered hopelessly blank and lost. This represents a breakout from the closed-door policy of other days. There was, Olmsted continued, at the governor's parties, some of the expected food, and then there was dessert. Dessert was the presentation of a Christmas pageant acted and sung by inmates of the Mansfield State Training School. 
Governor Dempsey must have anticipated and felt the sudden drop in temperature of his holiday audience as he announced what we were about to encounter. He must have understood, too, that some of us, not zealous to see the less happy side of humanity, had great difficulty in looking at the performance then presented to us. But we think the governor knew also that as the performance and presence of these fellow human beings continued, some of us might grow stronger and be able to open our eyes and turn our heads and we would be better for it. And certainly he knew that to make us look at this and go beyond our sense of shock to a sense of gratitude and shared humanity was a fit and proper thing to do in a season named after Christmas. What a sign of how far we've come in 50 years. It's in the intensity of his regard for these unfortunates, Olmsted concluded, in the passion of his determination to promote every possible ounce of public responsibility for them and feeling with them, that John Dempsey, as man and governor, is going to leave his own and very special mark on Connecticut and leave his mark he did, though he didn't do it alone. If his mother inspired him to take risks for the needy, John Dempsey's wife, First Lady Mary Frey Dempsey, who's with us today, thank you for coming, became the anchor supporting him, not just in making a home and raising a family, but in helping accomplish much of the radical goodness he tried to effect. Once at a National Governors Conference meeting with New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller and Michigan Governor Mitt Romney, Rockefeller, who knew Dempsey's reputation for advocating for the rights of the handicapped, leaned over and asked, almost in a whisper, whether any of the Dempsey children were mentally retarded. My first reaction, Dempsey said, was to say no. But Mary, before I had a chance to say anything, answered yes. Every youngster in the state of Connecticut who is retarded is, <clears throat> excuse me, is our kid. That was the best answer of all, said Dempsey. In their commitment to keeping the needs of the less fortunate squarely before the public, the entire Dempsey family would participate in annual summer outings with groups of physically and mentally challenged and blind adults and children at state parks around Connecticut, where Dempsey would play baseball and other sports events with the clients and engage in swimming contests in which the governor, unfortunately, always lost. What comes through in the accounts of these events is that they weren't what we today think of as photo ops, though that indeed was part of it, but events where genuine affection and warm fellow feeling were at the center of everything. If the governor was successful at selling the legislature on the need for new facilities and services for the less fortunate, it was in part because of his conviction that that was the most important reason government existed was real and it was contagious. But it was also because John Dempsey possessed extraordinary political talent. People, even political opponents, liked him. And he could use relationships to make deals. One of his truly extraordinary gifts, one he possessed even in the early days at CARE, was an absolutely uncanny ability to remember names. As friend Bill Stanley remembered, if he met you once, he would remember your name forever. When he met you, if you told him your wife and children's names, the next time he saw you, he would remember your name, and he'd ask about the health of your wife and children, and he would call them by name. That ability, so useful to a politician, was most evident the first day Dempsey returned to care after a 32-year absence people were lining the streets and he was coming into town and as he came near care there were people along the road and he stopped the car and he got out and he looked up in the crowd and he called out Timmy Looney see I didn't forget well you can imagine you can imagine the reception of that trigger 
The people whose names he remembered didn't forget either, and they loved him for caring enough to remember them. Of course, a likable nature and a good memory for names alone don't account for John Dempsey's extraordinary success at transforming state government, which is what he did across so many fronts, human services, education, transportation, environmental protection, even the constitutional organization of government was restructured under his watch. A historian studying state government before Dempsey came into office and after he stepped down encounters two very different entities. So many of the agencies and programs that are essential to the operation and well-being of the people of Connecticut today came into existence on his watch. The reason he was able to do so much was because Dempsey as an executive was an extraordinary manager and that too, I believe, can be traced to his roots in care. I mentioned earlier that John's father, Noel, was a supervisor at the Going and Smith flour mill by the bridge. Well, I guess from the top floor of the mill, Ed Dempsey had a pretty good view of the surrounding town and he used that perch to keep an eye out for young John. My father used to keep tabs on me from the top floor of that mill, Dempsey recalled, and he would use his distinct and piercing whistle to stop me from mischief, like stealing Black Tom's crab apples. As governor, John Dempsey managed people just the way his father managed him. He was known for choosing people fit to the task he assigned them, and he'd let them run their own show, while keeping watch from the top floor of the state capitol, as it were. And when he saw things about to go amiss, he didn't hesitate to blow the whistle and set things straight. If he heard or read something that puzzled or rankled him about the operations of one of his departments, he would have the commissioner in charge of that agency in his office the same day to clarify the situation and, if necessary, address the problem. A longtime member of the governor's staff reported that he only saw Dempsey angry once when he found out there was a $37 million deficit in the welfare account and that the welfare commissioner was on a month-long vacation in Florida. A newspaper editorial reflecting on Dempsey's career said, Dempsey demanded accountability of himself and those who worked for him, and in return, he defended them against any charge from any critic. And you can bet your whistle that management style had its roots right here in care. Dempsey was an education governor, and that too came from care. He supported a multi-year expansion of the University of Connecticut that transformed it from a good state college into a top national research university. He passed legislation to create the state's first schools of dentistry and medicine, and today the John Dempsey Hospital is a leading institution in the developing field of precision medicine. Dempsey also established a network of regional and community and technical colleges that today provides affordable access to higher education for 67,000 students a year. And simultaneously, he increased state education uh, to schools in all of the state's 169 cities and towns. Why was good education available to all such an important part of his political agenda? As Dempsey himself said, the sole reason my parents emigrated was to give me a good education and a good start in life. In those days, in care, little or no secondary educational facilities were available to ordinary people. I must add, though, that when Dempsey returned in later years, he noted with both pleasure and pride how much education in Ireland had been improved. Like many Irish Americans, Dempsey was both an ardent patriot, and a committed Irish nationalist. The source of both, I think, and certainly the latter, was an event that happened on the Mall in Care in the summer of 1921 that was, to a six-year-old boy, simply terrifying. In an effort to capture the IRA leader, Dan Breen, who was rumored to be hiding nearby, all the people of Care in Ned Dempsey's neighborhood, including his entire family, were herded into the mall as soldiers searched house to house for the fugitive. While Breen, disguised as a priest, made his way out of town blessing the enemy searchers as he departed, 
young Dempsey got a taste of freedom denied in the town of his birth, and it stuck with him. As he prepared to leave the governor's office, Dempsey was asked who his heroes had been. He mentioned Abraham Lincoln, who freed the enslaved and led America through its civil war, and Franklin Roosevelt, the president who guided the nation through both the Depression and World War II. But then he went on. I had other heroes too, he said, from earliest boyhood, men whose entire lives were a constant struggle for the cause of Irish independence. Those I particularly admired were Wolf Tone, the rebel who died at age 35 while fighting the British almost 200 years ago. Daniel Connell, called the Liberator for his efforts to obtain justice for Ireland during the early 19th century. And Michael Collins, the patriotic leader whose untimely death at 32 occurred while I was living as a boy in Ireland. The cause of Irish nationalism was important to Dempsey throughout his life. He often spoke of it in talks he gave to the many Irish American clubs and societies around the state. Sometimes, too, hints of it made their way into the broader American political arena, as happened during his 1958 campaign for lieutenant governor. His opponent that year was another Irish American, a Republican named Stephen J. Sweeney from the industrial town of Naugatuck. The two met face to face at a special annual event called the Meeting of the Crocodile Club, which takes place at a well-known Connecticut amusement park. There in the way of smiling crocodiles, politicians take good-natured satirical jabs at each other before a bipartisan crowd of onlookers. The Crocodile Club, in other words, is known for humor with bite. At this gathering, Sweeney was to speak before Dempsey, and he recognized that everyone would associate his opponent's name with that of the renowned prize fighter Jack Dempsey, who had lost a still famous fight to Gene Tunney in 1926. Now in Ireland, Sweeney began, there are kings and the Sweeneys are descended from them. But unfortunately, he went on, there are also sheep stealers there. He said a relative of one of the sheep stealers who had since come to Connecticut had fought a prize fighter named Gene Tunney some years ago, and he warned people that if they saw this man, they should protect their sheep from being fleeced. The crowd roared as Sweeney took his seat. Dempsey then rose and responded. We got rid of kings in Ireland in 1922. We also got rid of sheep stealers, except one family named Sweeney. He said it had been ascertained that the Sweeney family was now living in Naugatuck, Connecticut, and that word was being sent to the IRA about the discovery. By all accounts at the time, Dempsey won this match. Both Dempsey's Irish and his American patriotism were deeply connected to his Catholic faith, which was the anchor of all he did throughout his life. To him, service to God and duty to country were part of the same Christian call to serve others that lay at the foundation of his beliefs and his actions. His parents and he had become naturalized citizens as soon as the five-year waiting period for new immigrants uh, was over in 1930. As they left the chambers where they'd just taken the oath of citizenship, Dempsey remembered his father saying, we're Americans now, and with the help of God, we'll see to it that America is never sorry. We must do what we can for this country. And in a career of office that stretched out 35 years with an additional 19 years of public engagement after that, Dempsey did more for my country and state than perhaps any other governor before or since. John Dempsey was not a man afraid to invoke the name of God in reminding his fellow citizens of their duty. And he didn't do it in the stuttering, half-embarrassed way one finds today, at least in so many American politicians. Dempsey's faith was very real. Its imperative to help others was just as real to him. And just as John F. Kennedy called on Americans to ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, Dempsey never failed in word and deed to remind his fellow citizens that they had a God-given duty to think beyond their own self-interest. His devotion was to God, country, and certainly to the state, said his friend Bill Stanley. 
He achieved all he achieved without ever losing his touch of the simple man, his love of God, of country, and of his fellow human beings. John Dempsey admired John Kennedy, and he knew him well through his relationship with Connecticut party leader John Bailey, instrumental in Kennedy's election, and Abraham Ribicoff, the governor Dempsey served and succeeded. Dempsey shared all Irish Catholics' pride in Kennedy's election to the American presidency, and it was lost on neither Kennedy nor Dempsey that but for a certain provision in the United States Constitution, Dempsey had what it took to perhaps become another Irish Catholic president. Dempsey, as an immigrant, did not meet that standard. Don't you worry, we're going to get that constitutional provision changed, Kennedy said. Then he paused and said, but not till after I'm done. <laughs> Dempsey was on the highway between Boston and Hartford, returning from a meeting at the New England's Governor Conference on the afternoon of November 22nd, 1963, when a Massachusetts trooper stopped his car to tell him what had happened in Dallas. I could not have been more affected had the news concerned a death in my own family, Dempsey said. And I think most Americans felt the same way. I'm wholly convinced, he continued, that no one had a greater love for his country, a greater desire to see the world at peace, or a greater concern for the well-being of his fellow man. I sometimes briefly stop and reflect that the bullet in Dallas that day might have put an end to two presidents not just one. One source of Dempsey's transnational patriotism was the belief, as true in Ireland as in America, that government should be based on constitutions of the people and not the whims of monarchs. And just as Ireland in 1937 replaced the imperfect constitution it had implemented when Dempsey was a boy in care, Dempsey oversaw the replacement of an imperfect constitution in Connecticut that was 147 years old. In early 1964, a federal court ruled that Connecticut's way of creating legislative districts violated the fundamental principle of equal influence. Dempsey personally appeared before a three-judge federal panel to argue for Connecticut's ability to correct this problem without court intervention. The court assented, which led to the creation of a new state constitution, which Dempsey formally proclaimed as adopted in December of 1965. That document created the one-man, one-vote representation system that will perpetually govern Connecticut districting and marks one of the most distinctive moments in his political career. One of the most important programs of the Dempsey's administration Pathbreaking then and transformative now came about, I think, as a result of his 1965 trip to Cairn. Dempsey was an avid fisherman much of his life, and on the Friday of his week-long visit, he went with a ghillie to the banks of the shore, where he used to fish and swim, in quest of one of those big salmon, which were not so uncommon there, but which were almost extinct along the Connecticut River back home. A day of careful casting produced a beautiful speckled trout, but a good-natured argument soon broke out over its weight. Was it eight or nine ounces? One of the guys refused to carry it to the car, saying, ah, oh, I might get a bloody hernia. <laughs> Undaunted and intent on catching that salmon, the governor changed his travel plans to leave a day later and give him one more day for casting on the shore. So Sunday after Mass, he's back at the water, and prayers answered, he gets his salmon, a fine big one, on his hook. They took a picture, and it's plain to see that the governor that day was one happy man. Now this joy of fishing for good big fish in his boyhood stream, in his boyhood town, may not have been the only reason the concept had been sitting around for a while. But shortly after his return from Connecticut, Governor Dempsey called together a committee of 100 citizens from around the state to form a clean water task force. Its mission, as he told them, was not to be a committee to study pollution, but rather to develop and present to the General Assembly an action program to control water pollution that had become so bad 
the actress Catherine Hepburn called the Connecticut River the world's most beautiful open sewer. The result was America's first model pollution control program, enacted before the nation's own Clean Water Act, the start of a program that dramatically transformed New England's longest river, the Connecticut, as well as other streams from open sewers to vibrant sources of natural beauty, wildlife habitat, and recreation. In 2012, the Connecticut River was designated as the United States' first national blue way, a model of how communities can integrate their land and water stewardship efforts with an emphasis on source-to-sea conservation. So, if any of you go to CARE and you see that salmon, or rather one of her descendants, while fishing out on the shore, you be sure and let that fish know the people of Connecticut owe her a great debt of gratitude. John Noel Dempsey was proud to be Irish, and he was proud to be American, and he was proud of all the ways that the Irish in America had helped it become the nation it was. He saw his own life's work as part of that contribution, and he saw the, he saw the source of his ability to make that contribution as emanating from right here in care. Just a few months before he stepped down in office, Governor Dempsey made a speech at the 25th anniversary dinner of the Irish American Home Society in Glastonbury. And in, a, and in that speech, he talked about things that surely reflected his own experience, his own sense of self, and the importance of place. And here, I'll pick up his own speech in his own words. I think all reasonable men will agree, he told his audience, that in virtually every conceivable field of endeavor, the Irish have made contributions of outstanding importance to making America into the most powerful nation in the world. There are many, many sources to prove they did this, and that they are doing it today. However, he went on, when, he, when we asked how it was that the Irish, coming from a small and relatively obscure land, were able to do this, we find that question is more complex. One clue leading us to an answer may be found by going all the way back to the Old Testament, to the words spoken by Isaiah to the people of Israel. Look unto the rock from whence you are hewn, the prophet said, and to the hole of the pit from which you are dug out. Now, I don't pretend to be a biblical scholar, the governor said, but it seems to me that Isaiah is saying here that man is like a piece of stone. If you want to identify a particular piece of stone, you go back to the quarry from which it came. And in the same way, if you want to know what a particular individual is, you look back to his origins. John Noel Dempsey's origins were right here in Cairn. And he always, throughout his life, looked back to those origins with pride, love, and thanksgiving to God that he had placed him on this earth as a son of care, and that care had formed him early into the shape of the man he later became. When Dempsey returned after 32 years and stood in the square that July day 50 years ago, his first words were, my beloved people of my native town of care, this is one of the happiest moments of my life. I came here today to say in some very small way how very grateful my family and I are to many people in this town. They've never permitted me to forget that if I was to go to a strange country, and if I was to become part of it, then I should bring with me the traditions and the love and the faith of the Irish as my contribution to America. And that he did. John Noel Dempsey became a great governor of a great American state. And he made that state better by far than it was before he arrived. For that, I and all the citizens of the state I love and am proud to represent owe him and you, the people of care, a tremendous and lasting debt of gratitude. And I'd like to close, if I may, with a toast I believe John Dempsey himself would give if he were with us today. It's a toast he gave that night in 1970 at the Irish American home. And it goes like this. 
Here's to the land of the shamrock so green. By the way, we're supposed to have a class. <laughs> Here's to the land of the shamrock so green. Here's to each lad and his Irish colleague. Here's to the lands we love dearest and best, dearest and most. Bless America, unite Ireland. That's the real Irish text. Thank you. By the way, if any of you here know politicians, one of the things we historians like to remind them is that at the end of the day, it's historians who decide how you did. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming.